Hello. We're sorry not to be joining you in Mexico for the IAA coordinated research program on climate proofing of food crops. But I'm very happy to be able to present to you today some of the work that we've done relevant to this topic and I hope that that will lead to many further dialogues. We all know why we're having these important discussions at the meeting in Mexico this week. We know that we can meet the challenges in plant breeding and we've got many opportunities which have led to improved amounts, quantities and qualities of crops with better disease resistance. However, we are all aware now of the discussions about climate change, its consequences and its mitigation. Indeed, the top story on the IAE webpage this month was reporting a talk from Adibo Trahore. He noted that we have a combination of climate change, damaging soil and threatening agriculture as we practice it now. And then he also commented about the unprecedented numbers of people which we have to feed. Some of the challenges that breeders have are summed up in this picture from south of Addis Ababa in the Rift Valley of Ethiopia, which I took earlier in the year. Drought and unpredictable climate prevent crops being established in a timely fashion, and the consequences are exacerbated by overgrazing and the collection of trees for fuel wood. Themselves, of course, these are consequences of population growth and all lead to the loss of the soil, which is seen in the dust storm at the left of the picture. In the background of the image, though, it's worth noting that you can see the pylons carrying the product of one of the huge natural resources of Ethiopia, that is carbon-free electricity made from hydroelectric and geothermal sources, in this case, rather than nuclear. But certainly, this is part of the solution to increase increased food production through making fertilizer. At the crop level, clearly, within crops both genetic and agronomic factors are critical to meeting the challenges of increased and more sustainable production and that will be something that we'll be discussing extensively during this coordinated research program. Focus on climate proofing of crops, the homepage of the US government Climatic Data Center shows just one snapshot of the sort of challenges that illustrate what crops must be able to face. Unevenness and patchiness is emphasized here, with the overexploited breadbasket of the US being affected by cold, while the rest of the world, and particularly the little exploited breadbasket across Southwest Asia, is affected by heat. Climate, of course, has never been stable, and it's interesting to take a very long view, which my next slide is showing, covering the period of the whole of modern humanity. Agriculture is a relatively small part of human history, having started about 10,000 years ago, while people have been essentially unchanged for much longer, 50 to 100,000 years. By studying the events that have happened previously in our history, we can make suggestions about what can happen and then what we can achieve in terms of crop breeding in the future. Here, it's noticeable that the birth of agriculture was preceded by a rapid period of global warming. While the exact challenges facing the human population at this period of the dawn of agriculture are not really clear and were probably different around the world, many have a familiar sound to them obviously climate change, but also over-exploitation of wild species, human-driven habitat destruction, including that arising from technological innovations, and then population growth, plant and animal diseases spreading, and even the wish to do something other than collect food. Just as most people today worldwide would prefer to sit in an office rather than be out in the sun or rain hand-weeding a field. And we can see an illustration here of a little girl cowering in the shade, watching her mother weeding fields by hand. The points that I've just made are further expanded in this manuscript, incidentally in a volume edited by a regular contributor to the IAO FAO Genetics and Plant Breeding Program, Ari Altman. Here we review and reference some of the extensive literature on the numerous changes which were required from plants to make them suitable for domestication and agriculture. These are things like uniform seed germination, lack of seed dispersal, large harvestable parts, and a pleasant, nutritious product that makes a plant worth growing as a crop. So that it's not only the genetics of the plants that is responsible for domestication, but the people have to adopt new technologies and new knowledge about the growth of plants. Before agriculture, 
Not only were there no suitable genotypes, but there were no ploughs. There was no knowledge of how to weed crops or water them, harvest them, store or transport them. And all of these technologies, along with those for fields, field boundaries and so forth, had to be introduced at the same time in conjunction with the new genetics. One can point to the adoption of radical new technologies through farmers, all the points through the history of agriculture, whether that's in the ridge and furrows or water management or threshing and so forth, all the way not simply at the very start, but to the last few decades with the improved genetic approaches. Now additional information about the work and citation to the individual manuscripts are given on our website. Now, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to review some of our own work that's relevant to climate proofing of crops. Additional information and citation to individual manuscripts is given in our website www.molcyt.com and many publications there can be downloaded, sometimes requiring the password and user identifier both as visitor. We hope that this work with our many collaborators will be very helpful to developing new crops which will have the properties of climate proofing. And of course we're very keen to develop additional partnerships with you in this project, in this IAEA, FAO, CRP. Our works involved a wide range of crops and that's illustrated in front of me here, whether in the mustard, the bread, the peanuts, the banana, the linen, also in my jacket here. And in the, the cow is illustrating some of our work on forage grasses. The theme of my talk is super domestication and feed forward plant breeding. And I'm going to tell you about some of the genomic and molecular cytogenetics approaches that we've been using to this. For super domestication and feed forward, we need to plan ahead. and We need to ask what we need to meet the challenges of the crops for the future. Then we need to think about how we achieve these plans. And that's what I'm going to tell you about now. We've got to look and see what's happened in the past. We need to have access to biodiversity and new genes, whether through that diversity or through mutations, and also use those in new combinations through hybrids or introgression of wild species into cultivated species. The work that we're talking about here has an abiotic stress focus, that is to climate, heat, temperature, water, salinity, etc. But diseases, not only the crops, but also the diseases change with these abiotic stresses. And sustainability is of course a critical aim in what we're trying to breed. There's a range of different approaches and technologies that are applicable to these, but those are very wide and despite our work on a number of different crops of varying interests, we're still able to apply the same range of technologies. So over the next five minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about our recent research in molecular cytogenetics, starting off with telling you something about the banana genomic sequence. Bananas are one of the most important fruit crops, certainly my favourite fruit, and recently with work led by Sirad and Angelique Dant in uh, France, we've been able to publish the whole genome sequence of this crop. Increasingly, the species that we're working with have full genome sequence, and that gives us access to knowledge of all of the genes that are present in, this, in the genome, all the disease resistance, all the stress resistance, and all of the agronomic and food-related, yield-related qualities. That's useful for access to diversity and for breeding, as well as being of fundamental importance. We've been working too with brassica diversity, another important vegetable and oil crop worldwide. It's already limited by some of the abiotic stresses and particularly by the irrigation water as we can see in the picture up here where there's a borehole of about 25 metres deep, slowly lowering the water levels of the water tables. Brassica has a wide germplasm pool, and there's both the diploids and tetraploids, as shown in the U-triangle here, which, is being, which are being cultivated. Interestingly though, when we were assaying some of the diversity of germplasm with Faisal Nuras, who has just returned to Northwest Frontier province in Pakistan, we were looking at some of the Pakistani land 
And what did we find? We actually found that one of the Brassica germsayers, which shouldn't have the Brassica oleracea, the cabbage and cauliflower genome, actually had some very good evidence for the presence of that. So presumably in the past, breeders have made crosses that have been able to intergress these characters from the wilds, from the other cultivated species, into the oilseed mustard, which is used across the Punjab, and that has character has been selected for by breeders subsequently and is still present in some of these land races. That's an example then of how we can look at what present what present is what is present in a genome and how breeders have acted upon it. Another interesting piece of work that we've been involved with was with uh, Bob Graybosch and his colleagues in um, USDA and there of course like many diseases virus resistance is very interesting there are no sprays against virus and the only way to control wheat street mosaic virus up till now has been by controlling the spread of the vectors you can see here lines of wheat and the wild species showing the effect of the wheat street mosaic virus the Thinopyrin and the lines of wheat, which have got thinopyrin chromosomes and the resistance genes incorporated, are resistant, whereas the other wheat lines have become yellow and are susceptible to the virus. If we look at the chromosomes then, we can show that introgression of a whole chromosome arm from thinopyrin into the wheat line, and that's carrying those genes, and that led last year to the release of a new variety called MACE. The wheat situation uses wide crossing between wheat and the wild relatives to introduce the characters from the wild relatives. Another approach that we've been involved with, with collaborators particularly from the University of Nottingham, has used cell fusion hybrids to bring together different genomes. And here's a good example showing the ornamental tobacco species, Nicotiana sanderi, which is very susceptible to a fungal disease in this case. The wild species, which doesn't have very showy flowers, is highly resistant, and the cell fusion hybrid, which was made and analysed, shows the full resistance of the plant the fungus, but it also shows decent flowers for the ornamental market. We can analyse the chromosomes here, and in fact both of the ancestral species are themselves tetraploid, so that when we look at the hybrid, we can actually identify four sets of chromosomes in the cell fusion hybrid, bringing together all of these genes, including those for the Peronospora resistance. In the introduction to my talk, I mentioned something about what happened at the beginning of domestication, eight to 10,000 years ago. Noticeably, Many of the crops that we grow now were domesticated in that period, and those included not only wheat and rice, barley and so forth, but also a species called broomcorn millet or Panica miliaceum. Right at the beginning of agriculture, the evidence is that it was nearly as abundant as wheat and rice in uh, people that were growing it, in the cultures of the people that were growing it then, but now its production is only 1% of that of rice or wheat. So what's the reasons that it fell out of domestication? Well, we really don't know that, but it has a particular value for future work and future particularly resistance to abiotic stresses because the photosynthesis type, the MADH photosynthesis that it has, it makes it the most water efficient plant of any that are grown at the moment. We've been looking with, again, with other collaborators and Harriet Hunt particularly, at what the parents are of the broomcorn millet, and then asking about some of the questions about why it hasn't joined the modern staple crops. While we're near to answering the question about the parents, we're very far from answering what's wrong with it. But clearly, it's a character, it's a plant where the characters of super domestication. Why has it fallen out from use, despite the advantages it has in water efficiency, can be now addressed. 
Another example that I want to show you of another tetraploid crop is in work with, with Ana Claudia Arujo and David Bertioli from Embrapa in Brazil. They've been looking at the origin of the arachis, the tetraploid peanut, and it's a very recent tetraploid, maybe only the same age as the agriculture. But the two diploids that make up the peanuts diverged from a common ancestor about three and a half million years ago. So we've been looking at the ways that these genomes have evolved and separated. And interestingly, the genes remain very, very similar and in the same order all the way along the chromosomes. However, the repetitive DNA has changed dramatically and it's both diverged and amplified distinguishing the two genomes in the tetraploid. As well as looking at the repetitive parts of the genomes, we're also interested in looking at the effects of genes. And this work with Céline Tomaszewski, Ulrika Anhalt and Suzanne Bath is looking at the ways that the yield is controlled in ryegrass, ryegrass being a very important crop for animal feed throughout the uh, temperate areas. The abiotic stress resistance and biomass genes are key targets for breeders there and you can see the field trials here that were grown in Ireland a few years ago and which provided the basis for fine mapping the characters which led to high biomass in some of the lines. You can see that a few genes are located along the chromosomes and have these peaks in the QTLs here and that's letting us identify candidate genes which are giving us the characteristics of high yield and then we can take those forward into breeding programs in order to combine desirable characteristics. The final example that I want to talk about is the linseed, the linum, and this is a very useful crop for both the fibre, the flax, and also for the oil. This is a project based in Ethiopia with Wako Miret, and he's been involved with characterising by morphology and molecular markers some 200 accessions. And these have been in, carried forward into crosses where we've been looking at the inheritance and nature of the different characters. Also, by uh, identifying the elites that are present in that material, the farmer led trials have been established. And here you can see the male and female farmers that we've been working with growing the plants just a couple of months ago in the fields in Ethiopia as they're coming into flower. And we hope to get some very good feedback as to what characters the farmers need from these crops in order to encourage them to grow them for meeting some of the major food security questions that there are. So how then do we bring all of this together? Well, I've shown you some of the specific range of work that we've been involved with. And I hope that I've also mentioned how that work is applicable. And particularly, I'd like to now think how these things can be applied directly to meeting the United Nations Millennium Development Goals or M2030.